The year is 2020. We are in the midst of a worldwide pandemic. Schools are shut down, along with bars and restaurants and barber shops and salons and movie theaters. Businesses that are deemed essential remain open, while many more are closed. 6.6 .6 million people became unemployed and probably uninsured as their insurance is provided by their employer. Just the situation you want in the middle of a pandemic. In response, our government has given trillions of dollars to the corporations and peanuts to the common people the ones that most need it. Meanwhile, the general populace is running to the store to hoard, to clear out the food aisles, as well as paper goods, such as toilet paper, which are now all but impossible to find, essentially creating a black market for toilet paper in which they can set a high price. Some of this is panic, but a lot of it is opportunism. Quite a few people find our current president's response to this crisis to be seriously lacking. And you would think that would make him extremely beatable in an election year. Unfortunately, the Democrats are running Joe Biden, who is struggling to speak in complete sentences and is a shadow of his former self as he shows signs of serious cognitive decline. So much so, that if he were to win, it would be the weekend at Biden's presidency. What could be a layup is now a game of toss-up. It's hard not to feel that what we will be getting in the near future is a second term of Donald Trump. Meanwhile, our government which includes not just our current president, but both parties are doing shady things behind the scenes that they can get away with because we are all terrified of the pandemic. They are taking advantage of the moment to further restrict our rights. And God only knows what else. If this all sounds like a bad dystopian sci-fi novel, well, I'm sorry to tell you, but this is all real life. This is the situation where even the average person is under tremendous amounts of horrible stress, leading to a decline in mental health. And that's before we start talking about the people who on a daily basis suffer from serious mental health issues, such as anxiety and depression, who in the best of times battle with their own minds, a battle which claims many lives. And these are not the best of times. I suffer from anxiety and depression. If you know me, that's not exactly breaking news. Or even if you've just watched a single video of mine. When this all started, I didn't realize things would get as bad as they did. I was making bad jokes on Facebook and in my daily life. 
when it became obvious that things were far more serious than I thought they would be. Well, let's just say I was still making bad jokes. But it also started to impact on my mental health. It's unusual for me to feel lower in March than I do in January. But here I was. I found myself withdrawing from what little social contact I was permitted under the circumstances. I wasn't able to have my daughter, which increased the level of guilt I experience as a single dad that the kid doesn't live with. I found myself experiencing the odd anxiety symptom. My heart would beat out of its chest. My breath would be shallow. I would experience a pain in my stomach that I hadn't experienced since the good old days of the aftermath of my divorce. As things progressed, it became more and more uncertain whether I would continue to work or if Duncan would be shut down. That uncertainty led to more anxiety and that wasn't even taken into account that every day that I showed up at work I was risking getting sick. And man, did I seriously need a haircut. I take heart in the idea that I am not alone in experiencing these things. That these feelings are not unique to me. To one extent or another, we are all suffering. We are all experiencing this. And that is highly unusual. I can't remember the last time we had a universal experience. Probably not since 9-11. It's frustrating that it's possible I might have to put my dreams on hold. But once again, I know I'm not the only one. For instance, my friends are supposed to be getting married. As of now, it's unclear whether they're going to have to postpone or not. High school seniors might miss their prom and other such experiences. And that is just the tip of the iceberg. Many things are getting postponed or canceled altogether. All things considered, despite the struggle, I seem to be holding together pretty well. But there are many who that's not true of. There was an article written for USA Today titled, Isolation is a Big Trigger. Feelings of suicide are amplified amid a pandemic. Written by Ala E. Dastiker. The article was written on March 24th of this year. The article says, As the coronavirus spreads across the globe, there is a recognition its toll will exceed the scope of the virus itself. Deaths will be caused by COVID-19, closing in on 500 in the U.S. alone as of Monday. And long-term health problems. Others will be frayed by the havoc, loneliness, and financial insecurity caused by the disease. The data on past outbreaks and suicide is conflicting. But suicide prevention experts say it is reasonable to expect the current pandemic will lead to increased suicide risk for certain populations. Social distancing and quarantines may trigger those dealing with suicidal thoughts. And research shows the social and economic fallout from the pandemic may amplify the risk for some people well after the outbreak is ended. Those deaths will be harder to count. 
There are ramifications, sometimes fatal, with events like these that are not just related to getting infected or dying from infection or consequences of infection, said Eric Crane, co-director of the Center for the Study of Prevention of Suicide at the University of Rochester Medical Center. It is important to honestly and openly consider that there might be adverse events that occur in the midst of social distancing. Social connection has become a crucial part of the language of suicide prevention. The more connected people are, experts say, the less likely they are to die by suicide. But the public health approach to stem the coronavirus requires people to forego in-person connections, conversations, touch, serendipitous encounters that make up the social fabric of people's lives. The pandemic has also created major challenges around mental health care. Many therapists are no longer seeing clients in person, and not everyone has insurance that will cover telemedicine. Isolation is a big trigger for a lot of people, said Noreen Vanderhoeven, a licensed clinical social worker in California. With SARS or H1N1, it was on such a different scale than what we're dealing with now. People are becoming so anxious because they don't know what to expect. Anxiety is the fear of the unexpected or unknown. This article brings up a number of points that are not getting any attention, or at least not very much attention, in the media or elsewhere. The crisis is being talked about in economic terms or in physical health, both of which are important. But as usual, mental health is either getting ignored or not getting its due attention. The fact of the matter is, isolation fosters depression and leads to suicides. Economic stress fosters depression and leads to suicides. We are going to lose people for other reasons than just the virus itself. On a good day, mental health is not taken seriously enough. And like I said before, these are not good days. Those who suffer from anxiety and depression are not the only ones who are suffering more than the average person. There's a thing called health anxiety otherwise known as hypochondria, which comes in two classifications. Illness anxiety disorder, which is if a person has no physical symptoms or only mild symptoms. Or somatic symptom disorder, when the person has symptoms that are perceived as distressing to them or if they have multiple symptoms. According to Healthline.com, health anxiety is an obsessive and irrational worry about having a serious medical condition. It's also called illness anxiety and was formerly called hypochondria. This condition is marked by a person's imagination of physical symptoms of illness. Or in other cases, it's a person's misinterpretation of minor or normal body sensations as serious disease symptoms despite reassurance by medical professionals that they don't have an illness. If your body is sending you signs that you're ill, it's normal to be concerned. Health anxiety is marked by constant belief that you have symptoms or symptoms of a severe illness. You may become so consumed by worry that the distress becomes disabling. If you're concerned about your health, the rational thing to do is see your doctor. With health anxiety, You'll feel extreme distress about your real or imagined symptoms even after medical t test results come back negative and doctors reassure you that you're healthy. This condition goes beyond having a normal concern for one's health. It has potential to interfere with a person's quality of life, including their abilities to work in a professional or academic setting, function on a daily basis, create and maintain meaningful relationships. To put it mildly, 
anybody suffering from this condition under these circumstances is in hell right now. This condition can be treated with cognitive behavioral therapy, which I've discussed quite a few times during the course of my videos, as well as medications, including antidepressants. The National Alliance on Mental Health, NAMI for short, has several recommendations for how to protect your mental health during the coronavirus outbreak and the current crisis. They read as follows. Number one, maintain a routine. If you're not used to working from home, you may find the transition challenging. Creating a new teleworking routine will help you get into the right mindset, feel more productive, and keep the boundaries between work and home from blurring. It may be tempting to work into the night, sleep in, and log into your computer from your bed. This is not a good idea. Instead, stick to a regular bedtime and waking schedule. Shower and dress in the morning, and keep normal working hours if you are not required to be on call. You don't have to put on a suit, but wearing casual Friday work clothes instead of sweats will serve as a cue to start the work day. Number two, take reasonable precautions, but don't go overboard. Use only reliable sources of information, such as the CDC or John Hopkins University to inform and make a plan for your health habits. As hard as it is, it's important not to give in to compulsive behavior. This is especially important if you have OCD or health anxiety. Follow the rules you have made in advance so you don't let anxiety dictate your behavior. For example, if 20 seconds of hand washing is the accepted guideline, don't wash for 40 or 60 seconds just to be safe. Number three, find ways to get going. Now more than ever, you need to tend to your own health. Practicing sound mental hygiene can help boost your psychological immunity. If you are prone to depression, you might find it harder to get out of bed in the morning. Motivate yourself to accomplish chores or get started on a work project. Exercise is an excellent stress reliever and mood booster. The gym may be closed, but you can go out for a brisk walk as long as you keep your distance from others. You can also practice yoga at home and even work out virtually with a personal trainer. Number four, try not to fixate on sleep. The changes in your usual schedule, coupled with anxiety, can wreak havoc on your sleep. If you're resting, try not to stew about not sleeping. Staring at the ceiling at 2 a.m. will just create a cycle of worry and insomnia. If you find yourself lying in bed awake, wide awake, for more than 50 minutes, get up and change the mental channel by watching TV, reading a book, or listening to music. Me personally, to deal with my anxiety at night, I will often listen to YouTube, specifically rain or music sounds. Number five, stick to consistent meal times. That's pretty self-explanatory. Number six, follow your regular mental health treatment plan. Number seven, practice mindfulness and acceptance techniques. Whether you use meditation, yoga, or prayer, focusing your attention on the present moment rather than ruminating about a catastrophic uncertain future can help you manage your distress. If you t tend to compound your negative emotions with a cascade of negative thoughts, I should be handling this better. This is unbearable. Mindfulness training can be useful in tempering your emotional reactions. And lastly, number eight, be kind to yourself. A vast body of research conducted by the psychologist Kristen Neff and colleagues has shown the value of self-compassion for coping with emotional challenges and adversity. To ease feelings of isolation, acknowledge your struggle with kindness rather than self-judgment and recognize that millions of people worldwide are sharing your experience right now. This time is challenging for everyone, but you don't need to compound the difficulties by neglecting your mental health. If you follow these suggestions, you can face this crisis. You may even come out of it stronger in the end. I've known darkness. 
In fact, it's been a pretty constant companion. The one thing I've learned over the years is that the darkness passes. The sun comes out. We are not living in great times, but these times will end. Life will continue on. My friends will get married. I will once again be reunited with Julia, and I will continue my pursuit towards my dreams. Many more millions of people will get their lives back on track. They'll go back to work. They'll meet people. They'll get married. They'll have children. Life will continue on. So to those who are struggling extra hard, struggling harder than the average person, I say to you, hang in there. Because the darkness will clear. The sun will rise. This shall pass. There are people out there who love you, who care about you. Keep that in mind in your struggles. And I hope that it comforts you, that I share your struggle. And as always, I say to you that you are not alone.